views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access Fort Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at Guard Sergeant Ignacio uh, Silva and Specialist Terrace McKinney. Uh, this program will be talking uh, mostly with uh, Sergeant Silva about his experience in, uh, in uh, Iraq. Uh, let's start out. When, when was you in Iraq? What years? I, I was in year? Iraq for the year 2008. 2008. Yes. Things quieted down, uh, starting to quiet down about then? Yes. Uh, when we first got there, um, when we first got there, right off the bat, things were, uh, we was a little nervous. Um, it was in a new place. It was, it was beautiful. <laughs> it was a beautiful, beautiful scenery, believe it or not, but uh, it was, it was, we was a little nervous. Yeah. My grandson-in-law said it was beautiful. Some Parts was beautiful. The, the sunset, and the, and the sunrise is beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. They've got uh, what the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. Mm -hmm. Probably that brown there is where it's uh, prettiest, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, what was your? Who was you with there? I was with Bravo Company, First 293rd out of Fort Wayne, Indiana, um, out of here, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, which one? Bravo Company, oh. First 293rd on Cook Road. 293rd. Yes, Army okay. National Guard. Okay. Did they? How many did they have over there? As a unit, as a 76th Brigade, we took about 4,000 soldiers. Was it that many? Yes, from the state of Indiana. We took 4,000 soldiers over to Iraq with us. And the way our deployment started, we, we trained for two months down in Fort Stewart, Georgia. It was a basically a re, uh, re learning our skills. Um, Going full speed, uh, going full speed combat drills. Um, we didn't get much sleep during that two months. It was, it was, it was all go, all cylinders, um, everybody moving in sync. Then right after that, we came home for four days, spent some time with our families, um, said our last goodbyes, and then we went overseas. Um, we spent a couple weeks in Kuwait, um, getting acclimated to the weather. Um, everything once again was full go full combat drills out there. Then right after we left Kuwait, we went straight to Iraq. We, w we came in through Baghdad. Yeah. And then we went to Camp Anaconda. Do, do they fly them back and forth? Or? Yes, yes. Uh, believe it or not, there's planes, go uh, there's, uh, planes going out all the time, in and out, in and out. A ma majority of the time it's at night. Um, and coming flights at night. Yeah. How hot did it get over there, really? I mean, it's... <laughs> when I first got there, I think I was too scared to know how hot it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but when I went on leave, I, came, I went on leave for two weeks, came back home about the middle of my deployment, came back home, spent some time with the family. It was during the summer. Uh, spent some time with the family. Um, when I went back to Kuwait, I believe I got into Kuwait about 12, 30, 1 o'clock at night. At that time in Kuwait, it was 126 degrees wow, at night. At, at night, wow! <laughs> it was 126. When I opened the door, it was like I got punched in the face pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're a lot of equipment too. I mean. Oh yes, yes. Um, but the equipment that we have now um, is, is uh, better for the weather, better for the heat. 
Um, it, it allows air to come in and out of the equipment um, and, and the uniform as well. Uh, we actually have a combat shirt that we wear that is kind of like the moisture wicking material. Um, so, I mean, we, wear, we can wear these, but we also have a, a moisture wicking material uh, top shirt that we wear that we put our rank on also. Oh, okay. Yeah. Really makes you cool, huh? Oh, yes. <laughs> Looks cool, too. Yeah. No. <laughs> how was the, uh, you said how scared you was. <laughs> That's, that quieted down after a while, I suppose. I mean, you calmed down. Yes. Uh, when we first got there, like I said, I was scared for the first couple of days. Yeah. Uh, we actually took over for Texas. Texas uh, was there before us and kind of helped us uh, show us around the base show us the, to what missions we would be doing. Uh, I was on a convoy patrol. I was a lead gunner on a convoy patrol. Um, the first mission we went on, believe it or not, um, we got ambushed right off uh, about a mile outside the gate. Um, took some, in, some incoming fire. We took some incoming fire right off the gate, fire from both sides of the road, and that's why I earned my combat infantry badge that I, that I wear. Um, that, was, that was our... It was seven. I was seven days in Iraq, and that was the first mission that I did, yeah. and took some and got ambushed. Right about a, for the first thirty days, things were pr pretty tough. Like that, some different units uh, with the first 293rd and the 76 were getting hit. Um, then it quieted down. Um, for the like I said, the first thirty days it was pretty rough. Yeah. Right after that, the next six months it really quieted down. So. What kind of vehicles do you have? Oh, we had uh, obviously Humvees. And um, we also took out uh, ASV and the MRAP. There's the MRAPs are the mine resistant and, uh, yeah. armor yeah. vehicles. And the ASV is, um, they're the, more like the SWAT team vehicles. They're like a, like a miniature tank, kind of. Mm -hmm. oh. And that was, that's what we took out. Um, that was, I was a lead gunner for ASV, ASV gunner. So those are equipped with the 50 cal and the, and the Mark 19. Is that the one that has a V-shaped bottom? Yes. Yes. Strikers, right? Yep. No. It, well, it's kind of like the striker. Oh. Right? Similar to. To a striker, you said? Yes. Yeah. They got kind of a, a I'd call it a fence around them. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Those, our, ours didn't. Our, ours did not. Yeah. Um, but, yes. Um, Supposedly, they would catch a, 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 what do you call them, a, those grenades? Uh, the IEDs? Yeah. Yes. No. Not the IEDs, the <laughs> some sort of grenade is fired. Um, I know what you're talking about. RPG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We, we never got hit with one. We, yeah. we, we've never got hit with one. Um, but yes, they're, those are, they're very, they're very reinforced. Uh, I felt safe right around of that thing, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> How was the... How was the food? The food. <laughs> the food. You know, the, the big thing about the, the military is uh, sometimes you always hear stories about the food not being very good. I can tell you from my experience over there, I went over there probably weighing about 165 pounds and gained about 50 pounds. Okay. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not, I mean, it wasn't all muscle. <laughs> <laughs> but the food, uh, those the soldiers are fed very well. Uh, Different nights, it just depends. Uh, sometimes it was steak and shrimp, sometimes it was steak and lobster, steak and lobsters, steak and crab legs. Um, anything that you could think about, it was more of like a golden corral over there. It was some of, some of the best food that I've ever eaten, believe it or not. That's all contracted out, I believe, isn't it? Yes, no? yes. Yeah. Yes, I think there's a, there's a couple of uh, contracted groups out there, one of them being KBR, that, that, um, provides the food for us. Yeah. What, uh, what kind of uh, weapons would they use? What was the, well, like one of the main ones that if they was firing, what would they be firing? The, our enemies? Yes. Uh, AK-47. AK-47. Yes. That was, that was, the, that was the main weapon. Um, and majority of the time it was a few pop shots here and there and that we wouldn't, we would never see them, you know. But a lot of the time, our, our biggest threat was the IEDs, uh, the the roadside bombs. Bombs, um, yeah. Yes. That was the most difficult part of it, being there, I imagine. Yes. Um, yeah. 
like I said, I, I volunteered to be a lead gunner um, because I, I wanted to be the guy that, that wanted to be, I wanted to be the guy up front. Um, it wasn't because I was trying to get a war medal or anything like that. I just, I knew that if I, I, I went up and did my job the best that I could, that I'd be able to take care of the people behind me. Yeah. Um, and, th and that's how I had my mindset. I really wasn't worried about losing my life as long as I knew everybody behind me stayed safe. Um, and that's what kept me going. Yeah. That's what kept me going. And, and I ended up, I did find a couple. I, I found one that, I, my first one that I found, I got an award for. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, it was tough. I can tell you feel good about being there. Oh yeah, I, I really do. You know, um, I was really, I was really happy to say that I've been there. Yeah. Um, when I first joined in 96, um, to 2000, nothing was really going on at that time. Yeah. I was an infantry soldier. Um, I trained to, to fight. I trained to fight, I trained to get deployed, but there was nowhere to go. There wasn't a fight at the time. And when I re-enlisted in 2006, the reason I re-enlisted because my brother and my cousins, they all enlisted right around that time. Um, I talked to them into going to the National Guard, um, getting their feet wet. Um, see if they liked the, the, the National Guard side of the house, and if they liked it, then they could transfer to active. Once they enlisted and they went through their training and came back, then they got the word that they were going on the deployment. <laughs> By saying that, I was the one that talked them into joining. I was the one that talked them into going to the Guard, um, and I always wanted to go, so I came back to go with them. Um, I, I wouldn't have felt comfortable if my brother went without me. Yeah. So... What did you miss the most about being over there? Sounds to me like it wasn't food. No, uh, you know, <laughs> you know the, the funny thing is I could, I could easily say I, oh, I missed uh, McDonald's or Burger King or Pizza Hut, but guess what? Those places were over there too. <laughs> <laughs> those places, Taco Bell, Popeye's Chicken, all those places were over there. So I couldn't say it was the food. I, I think the biggest thing that I, I missed the most was the family back home. Sure. I know my father, my mother, and uh, the rest of my family and friends. And, and people that I know probably worried about me and my, you know, and their family members and my brother over there. Um, but the biggest thing was is that I was more worried about people back home. I knew that I was safe. I knew I was with the best trained soldiers in the world. Yeah. I knew that no matter what, if something went wrong, I would still come back a hero. But I knew if I did my job well, I was coming back home. Yeah. I think the biggest thing for me was is that knowing that uh, um, my, my grandparents and uh, my parents and my sisters and the rest of my family was okay back home because believe it or not, it is, things are more dangerous here. You know, I, yeah, I, I, some areas, right. yeah, I think after 9-11, uh, there have been a lot of 70 year, year olds over there fighting if they could. Yeah. yeah. Just, that's just, Everybody was upset about that. Yes. Did, uh, when you get things sent over to you, was it trees or food? Uh, what was, what was you like? Well, uh, uh, yeah, there was some, there was some different care packages that came through the mail, um, through the, from the USO and different organizations back home that sent, uh, suntan lotion or, yeah. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> Um, my favorite was the candy, believe yeah. it or not, because the, the candy was hard to get over there. <laughs> there, there was candy, but not the, not the good stuff, I guess. <laughs> How was the people? To, was they glad to see you? The people, the, the Iraqi people. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, believe it or not, you know what you see on TV, um, or what the way some people explain uh, the people over there. When I went there. I actually had a mission where I had to, that was towards the end of my deployment. It was towards the end of my deployment, they actually sent me out with the Iraqi people um, whenever they would come on and off base to do, they actually contracted them, they gave them jobs, they actually they, they gave them jobs to come lay concrete or something like that. Um, I escorted, I was an escort back and forth off, off and on base. By talking with them, I, I learned a lot about them. I learned that they were happy that we were there, uh, that we were not fighting them. We were actually fighting the militias and the gang members or the, the gangsters, the Al-Qaeda's, that um, we, that's who we were fighting. 
we were protecting those people from them. Yeah. Um, they were very nice people. They 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 would bring me extra, you know, they would bring food for me. Um, we would all sit down and and uh, sit around the table and, and and just enjoy a meal and, and talk. I mean, and, and a lot of them knew English, um, and they spoke very good English, believe it or not. Yes. They, uh, they've got a lot of other schools up and going now, I think, don't they? Or oh. their schools. Overseas? Uh, in, Iraq. in Iraq. For the, for the people? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's, some, there's some different things that they're doing to help them yeah. uh, make their country <clears throat> grow. Um, there, there's some things that they're doing with the, with the youth and, and, and Iraq that they're trying to teach them different things and teach yeah. them uh, because a lot of those people are uneducated. Um, there, there really wasn't any schools over there. Yeah. Um, but they're they're really nice people. Yeah. I guess they uh, was having trouble for a long time with the electrical system. You know, it just it was just run down and yes. And I suppose the sewer system too. Yes. Um, they, they they're making improvements. We are helping them make improvements, um, and they appreciate the things that we're doing for them. Yeah. They they appreciate everything that we're doing. Um, the kids, the kids love us. The kids love us, and I, and you know, the the kids love us because of what soldiers before us did. The soldiers that went way before us um, took care of them, took them in, took them in with open arms. Uh, some of those soldiers that were before us missed their kids back home, and that was their their kids away from home. Um, gave them candy, gave them basketballs or soccer balls, and soccer is a big sport over there. It's it's a big sport all over the world, but. Um, the kids, you know, they would get free things from the soldiers, and and, and they love us, and, and it's building a relationship, you know, it's building yeah. a relationship with the people. Yeah. yeah, that's good to hear because you hear so many different stories, you know, you know, from the media, and you know, they just get the bad part sometimes, and well, they try to push that too much. I think. Right. I I don't think they necessarily try to push it, but you know, by maybe this might be the wrong thing to say, but. A lot of the times when people want to turn on the TV, they want to see an action movie. Yeah, um, they, that's they, true. Uh, they, that's they, true. They want to see action. They want to see violence. They want to see drama. Right. Um, if, if it came on the TV every day that, that things were sunny and bright over there, most people probably wouldn't watch the TV anymore. Um, but that's it, true. And that's the, but, you know, by being over there, yes, there are some things. There are some soldiers that come home wounded. There are people that they get hurt. Um, but it is not that bad, believe it or not. I guess there's what 4,500 deaths in Iraq so far, and of course it'd be thousands of wounded, mm -hmm. and mostly from from IEDs. Yes, uh, it seems like they could come up with some way to to spot those things some way. When. Uh being a lead gunner on a convoy, I had to have my head on a swivel. I had to have my eyes open at all times. Some of our missions um, were long. Some of our, you know, most all of our missions were at night. We move at night. Um, they are finding different ways. So there's IEDs are set up different ways. There's some that that go on motion, and, and they and they go off. Some are triggered. Um, some are set off through a cell phone signal. Uh, some of them are set off um, by heat, the heat of the vehicle. Um, now we are setting up ways where we have an arm in, in front of the vehicle that's you know eight to ten to twelve feet um, that has a little box in it that's hooked up. Some some engine fluid goes through it, so it generates heat. Um, that way, it could set off the bomb before we get there um, or the IED. But yes, it, it, it is tough to look for them. But we are finding better ways. We are the 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 great thing about finding the IED is that now we give our people intel on how they're making them and how they're triggered. Yeah. So so the so the more effective I was at my job, the the more Americans I would help save later down the road. Yeah, sure. It still seems like there's as <laughs> <laughs> much that they could come up with something that'll, that'll I, spot them things. I've, mm -hmm. I've, you know, but the good thing about Fort Stewart, Georgia, before the deployment was, we were thrown different uh, dummy IEDs, you know, fake 
IEDs, um, we actually went down paths, um, down different roads, and they would put an IED on the side of the road or something like that, give us an idea of what to look for. Um, some of these IEDs could be placed in anything. Could be placed in a bicycle, or, um, microwave, or refrigerator, or uh, you know, they make rocks that look like rocks, but they're, they're paper mache. There's there's a lot of different things. And the bad thing about Iraq, or the hardest thing was, is that on the side of the road is where they threw their trash. Oh. So oh, yeah. uh, the trash, believe it or not, hid um, what we were looking for. Sometimes we would come up uh, on an empty box and come to a complete stop thinking that the box was an ID and really it was just an empty box. <laughs> uh, yeah. but, but you know what, we stayed alert at all times. Uh, we didn't take anything lightly and that's why, and, and I felt that's the reason why all of us came home safe. Yeah. A lot of the IEDs were made out of artillery shells, weren't they? Yes, <clears throat> or, or, or copper, copper um, shells that they, they melt copper. Um, those are called EFPs. Um, those actually um, can penetrate uh, through our armor. I don't know how they got the thought of making those, but um, it's, uh, it's like a copper shell that once the blast hits, it heats up so hot, it actually melts through our armor. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's, um, and it doesn't stop. It goes all the way through the vehicle, one side out the other, um, and, and doesn't miss a beat. Um, doesn't slow down. Those are the most. That's those are the most scariest ones. To, I mean, you, you just train to keep your eyes open, and and that's what we did. Yeah. Otherwise, that V-shaped one wouldn't stop it. It would go right, right. through there. Right. Jeez, how could they think of something? Like uh, they're very. You know, for for being uneducated people, they're very smart. <laughs> and that's. That's, you know, that's, uh, to me, it's kind of sad that somebody that could create something like that or can think of something like that would do it for harm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Instead of doing it for the good. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Did you much, when you came home, did you much, uh, notice much difference here? No. I, I, I didn't really, I, I noticed some things moved around or, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <clears throat> um, some of the you know different restaurants that I wanted to come back home to weren't there anymore, <laughs> but and some some new ones came up. But no, no, everything for the most part, everything everything was okay to come back to. Another thing, <clears throat> decompression. Did you hear that that word over there? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, I did. Um, It was, it was it was it was it was brought up, but it, um, I, I don't live that way. I, you know, I I, uh, I just take it day by day. Yeah. Well, I think the word or the decompression I heard about was when you came home, they would send you. I think a wait. You had to step there yes. for three days. Yes. Uh, actually, we uh, well we decompressed in Camp Atterbury. We went to Camp Atterbury to. Uh, get back in the, in the swing of things, um, um, just get reacclimated to the weather. Our family was allowed to come down if they were in the area or, you know, they'd come down, visit us for a couple hours and they had to leave. But it was just basically us out processing, um, out processing, putting some civilian clothes on again, um, eating Subway again, stuff like that. <laughs> but, but yes, it was a uh, it, it was it was an easy it was an easy deployment. It was it was a very well planned de deployment. Yeah. Well planned. Well, this young fellow was telling me about it. I, I guess did you get to come home any time during your deployment? Yes, yes. I actually took two weeks of leave, and that's when I said okay. when I came home and then went back is when I noticed the the the, the temperature oh, over there. So yeah. I, okay. I I came back home. Uh, <clears throat> Some soldiers were given the opportunity to come home for two weeks or actually go to um, go somewhere else for two weeks. Um, I actually decided to come home. It was kind of hard coming home and then having to leave again, um, but it was it was okay. Yeah. I I was okay with that. 
You know, it's a lot different than what it was in World War II. <laughs> they sent them over there and be three or four years for it yeah. before yeah. they got to come home. And I, I don't know <clears> how you guys did it, but... <laughs> well, in Korea, we just had, uh, I think minimum was a year, and then it went up from there, depending on what, uh, what you did. When in your convoy, how many would be in like a convoy uh, uh, when you go out? A convoy with military vehicles. Was, like say when you'd have to go out at night. You'd it, it was usually um, seven, seven, seven vehicles, seven vehicles. Uh, my vehicle was actually out um, close to a mile away from everybody else. Uh, we were the we actually um, the lead gunner. We would actually search for the IEDs. Once we got out far enough, then we would tell everybody else to come on through, push through. So we were the ones out there, out in the front. But the the thing was that sometimes if we escorted vehicles, mostly semis, we would take um, any, anywhere from 30 to 40 semis at a time. So seven vehicles spread out over 30 semis in length, um, we, were, we were spread pretty far. Um, but we trained for that. We trained for that. We knew where we were at at all times. Everything was in sync. Uh, we had the best communication, uh, best radios. We got the best uh, GPS or Blue Force trackers out there. Um, so if anything went wrong, if a semi in the very back or in the middle popped a tire and we had to slow down, we knew where we were at. Um, everything was in sync. Um, everybody knew their role. Everybody kept their eyes open. and. Uh, like I said, I was with the best trained soldiers. Right. Uh, you know, at night, I, it'd be so hard to see. You know, that's what's amazing. <laughs> it you is. It, it, it was It was very hard to see. Um, sometimes you thought you'd seen something and you didn't just because of the shadows. Um, but um, we also had night vision also, a night vision goggles, so that helped out a lot. And uh, in my ASV, and my gunner turret, I also had a, had a big... Uh, a night vision scope on there. So. Well, gentlemen, we're running out of time already. Right? Okay. <laughs> I appreciate you being here. And Thank you. We want to have you back to talk about uh, your recruiting. Okay. So, th th to the uh, viewers, thank you for watching. Uh, remember, uh, freedom is not free. Uh, gentlemen like these know better than anyone that it is not free. Thank you for watching. Good night.